So, so I'm going to talk about why you know host. Uh, if you don't already know why you know host, this is a um, self-hosting distribution try to make um, self-hosting accessible to uh, as many people as we can. Uh, so thanks to the organizer for selecting my tool, by the way. Um, so before I go into what actually does why you know host, I want to spend some time to uh, recall the motivation behind the why you know host and why we are so uh, passionate and why we think this is important to um, democratize self-hosting. So you probably already know those, uh, those terms, surveillance capitalism and uh, global surveillance madness. I'm not going to recall why, why this is so bad. Uh, I think we have been discussing this in the first community for like 10 years now. So just as a summary, if you uh, don't know how bad it is, basically, just remember that they want our souls. They want everything, every data about you. And they, will, they want every piece of data that they can gather just to try to uh, get a grasp on what makes us individuals and what makes us uh, society. And the way they gather this, uh, those data is through this, uh, this evil cloud of uh, of proprietary and centralized services. So you, I, I think I don't have to explain who, what these services are. You, we all know them. Um, but I think what, what's the point where we are at is that the, um, the general public is becoming quite aware that this is an issue, right? This cannot go on forever. We need to find some alternatives to this. But so people aren't, I, gi I see a lot of people like giving talks about why the GAFAMs are bad and why the Google Empire is bad and the NSA and so on. And then people ask, but what, what should we do? And actually, it's not quite obvious yet what is the answer to uh, those online services. There are some answers to other things like uh, using Linux and, and upgrade and so on. But for those services online, what are what are alternatives? And when we speak of alternatives, we want them to be, to be concrete and straightforward and to be alternatives, not just for nerds, right? We, we want uh, your, your parents should be able to use, to use them, your children and your friends, and not just us the, as technical uh, people. So let's try to take it seriously, like on, on a big scale. Like if, if Google disappears tomorrow, like, what would we say to people? What would we tell them to use as services such that, it can, uh, so, so that they can have the same services uh, as they do on Google and, and Facebook and other things? So uh, how will we, would we build this decentralized internet, right? And so far, it's not quite obvious what, what we would say to people if Google disappeared tomorrow. And it's not really because we lack uh, building, building blocks, right? We have all those uh, amazing fast software, uh, which is already working and already de delivering quality uh, services uh, comparable to um, what the Google Empire provides, for instance. So I just put my favorite here, but of course there are a lot of a lot of them. Um, but so I think what what we miss is a way to bind these these services together because people they don't want to hear that. To, instead, in order to get rid of Google, they should go to like 20 different websites, each of them say, serving a different service. We, we should have something to bind, bind them together so that you can just go somewhere else uh, where the services are, are free and open and ethical. Um, and that would, be, that would be nice. So do we have something that we could call like a libre platform or several libre platforms that we could... Um, proposed to people as alternatives to, uh, to Google and other um, surveillance capitalism services. So in fact, there is, there is a work which has been done by Framasoft. Actually, this is the, this is the example I will, I will be talking about. Framasoft, if you don't know it, is a um, French association. And a few years ago, they started this Degoogleify campaign. So they, they took this map of, of services, of proprietary services, and one by one, they built a, an alternative to those services using free software and made it, it, made it available to uh, the general public. And it was quite, it, 
it's quite successful actually. And you can go on their website and find uh, this list of services about, um, and basically you will, you will obtain equivalent services to all those, uh, to all uh, those uh, centralized services you find on Google. But there is, there is several issues with this, and, and actually the framers of people, they understand it. Uh, because the point is not to have, Google, have, have Framasoft as a replacement for Google, right? The point is decentralization. So we, we, we don't want to have a big entity as, a, as an alternative to Google. We want several uh, smaller entities uh, just, to have, just to not have centralization of power. So this is why they started this uh, Chaton initiative in France. Um, which is quite similar to the Libwester project, I think. And this is what we, want to, what we want to do. We want to have a lot of various local entities, uh, so Chateau and Libwesters and so on, um, which provide similar services to Framasoft. But to get this, we need to make it easy, actually, to replicate Framasoft model. It won't work otherwise. Otherwise, we will be like just a few a few chatons, a few Libwesters, and we won't be able to deliver a, com a competitive uh, alternative to the Google Empire and the, and the whole um, surveillance capitalism ecosystem. And the second point is, what about emails on fast file storage? In fact, the, the, the farmers of people, they were, they were not quite able to address this issue, like, what do we do with email on file storage to provide alternatives to Gmail, for instance, and Google Drive? And my point of view on this, my, my interpretation of this is that it is way too complex and expensive for, for small-scale third parties to, to build a realistic and affordable and quality alternative to uh, Gmail on Google Drive, for instance. So this is an issue, like what, what do we do with this? But of course, uh, since I'm talking about what you know, host, what, what if you add your own server and your and host data on your own on your own hard drives. And in fact, when you think about it, we have personal we have personal computers in everyday life. We even have pocket computers. But th those things were not quite obvious when uh, computing started. When we had the first computers, so having a personal computer was just like a fantasy. What you what would you do with it? And what would you do when it breaks? And and um, you, you don't have a PhD in electronics, so how are you, not, are you going to fix it? So why not have personal servers, um, in fact? And one reason is that server administration is, of course, madness. This is complete hell. Um, this is a time sink hole. You will spend your whole life doing this, and it is complicated as, as hell. But does it have to be? Does it have to be? Like, again, we, at some point, it was not obvious that personal computers uh, would exist. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go one step further and say that we won't get rid of surveillance capitalism if only a technical elite is able to uh, deploy and maintain servers. We don't have a, a professional army of uh, friendly and ethical sysadmin ready to work for free against surveillance capitalism, right? So we need everybody we can get and we need uh, something that even, even your parents and your friends and your children who don't necessarily know uh, technology uh, quite well uh, can use. Otherwise, you can build the best Mastodon thing and, and activity pub and the best uh, self-hosting uh, software. But if nobody is able to deploy them and maintain them easily, it won't just scale against, against the Google empire. So this is where Wayunost comes in. And I dub this, Wayunost can be seen as the Ubuntu of self-hosting, right? And the idea is that uh, before Ubuntu, basically, you had to know command line to uh, use Linux. You, can, you couldn't put Linux in the hand of your parents and your, and your children and your friends. And at some point, Ubuntu decided, OK, this, this Linux thing, it should be usable by the general public. So basically, how does it work? You're going to buy a, a machine. So if you want to self-host at home, you can use an RM board or a, an old computer. And you can also buy a VPS online. 
And then you're gonna download the pre-installed image that we provide, or you can also just install Debian, and then on top of Debian you can install Waynost. Um, and so then once you install Waynost, you're gonna get the web administration interface, uh, which uh, we think is quite simple. And then you're gonna be able to tell your friends to uh, sorry, you, you're going you're gonna to be able to install a few apps in just a few clicks. So this should be a video, actually. I'm not sure what, what it's not working, but anyway, it's not. Um, and then you're going to be able to uh, give access to your friends. So again, this should be a video. I'm not sure what, why it's not working, but you can give access via a uh, user portal to uh, the apps you install on, on what you know host. So I want to try to make a small demo of how actually why you know host behaves. Uh, not sure if I have so much time left, but anyway. So this is a, a, a server on which I just installed why you know host. So the first step is to run what we call the post installation. So in the post installation, you need to choose a domain. But hey, I don't have a domain name right now. So what can I do? I can use the a free nose.me domain provided by the Y uh, infrastructure. So let's say, let's call this FOSDEM uh, Y no FOSDEM. Okay, and so it's going to be configured automatically actually. So here I, want, I need to choose a secure, very secure domain uh, password. And then let's go. So I don't want to save this. OK. And then it's going to configure and initialize, basically, the, uh, the server. And the domain I chose, which I don't own yet, but it's going to be automatically configured. So you don't really need to configure any DNS records by N. So this is going to be, it's going to be like taking like one or two minutes. So I'm cheating a bit because I have another server on which I just run the post installation and it, and it finished. So I'm going to log in the Waynos interface. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to create a user for myself. So let's create a user called Alex. All X. So um, this user is going to receive an email. So Alex at them. 2019.nos.me because in fact I already have a fully functional uh, email stack working just right after the post installation. So let's create this user. Yes, it's done. So I'm going to show you that you can just install various applications. So you see we have all this application catalog. This is just the official application. So I'm going to um, install Nextcloud. So I need to tell it what, where to install it. So it's going to be available at them 2019.nos.me slash Nextcloud. OK, this looks fine. Alex is going to be the admin, so install it. OK, so it's going to take quite a while. Um, I wanted to show you that you can configure Thunderbird automatically. Um, yeah, already. So you have to show you that you really have a working email stack. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think I'm going to skip this to gain some time. So what I want to show is that after after the installation finishes, basically you end up on this screen, like in just two minutes. I can show you after I finish the talk. You end up on this screen. Uh, with an already working uh, next cloud. So just in a few minutes, the whole process. So like basically what I showed you is that in 30 minutes or one hour, if you are not used to it, you can basically set up a fully functional server with uh, several services, um, email working, and XMPP and other things. Also, you can install Let's Encrypt certificate. Obviously, I didn't show it, but just take a few clicks. Um, so a few, a few numbers about the status of the project. We, are, we have right now something like 3,000 3, instances. 
Uh, we have a quite active community on the forum and IRC and other things. Uh, we are a s kind of a small team with basically 10 regular contributors or maybe like between 5 and 15, depending of the period. And um, we have more than 100 working applications and a few, quite a few more um, in testing or in progress. And our current goals in the project are to basically smooth even more the user experience and increase the robustness so that people, uh, so that it's easier for people to have their server working and to di diagnose issues and so on. Um, we are trying to expand the user base, especially outside of, of, the, of France, because basically 90% of our users are in France. So if you are non-French, please use Wayno Host. And we also try to get funding. So if you have money, we have some paper for you. Uh, please come to us. In fact, we just uh, answered the call like two days ago. And we have quite a lot of happy users. So this is just a few, a few of them saying how Wayno Host is great and everything. Uh, if you want to help us basically uh, be a Wayno Host user, this can be the first step, of course. Please organize like install parties and please give us feedback on the user experience. Anything that is troublesome to you or that, or that is frustrating to you, please tell us. This is very important for us. Um, you can do quite a lot of other things, but I'm going to skip it. And yes, so the conclusion and the summary, once again, I really think that uh, the FOSS community is not conscious enough of how if we have the ambition to fight surveillance capitalism, we need and we must uh, make it simple and reduce the technical and human cost of server administration. Otherwise, we won't be able to have all those Libostar things and self-hosting things, and people won't be able to have a realistic alternative to uh, surveillance capitalism. And in fact, why not show that it can be done? We, we show that it's not just a fantasy. Uh, a lot of our, of our users uh, use what you know host without, uh, with limited technical knowledge. So not, not, not completely the general public, but we are getting there. And of course there is so much to do. And for this, we need your help. So please, please help us. And thank you. You're at least the sixth speaker today who is talking about UX exper UX. <laughs> so I'm pleased because I'm UX designer, <laughs> so. Any questions? The hardware you show in on which we should install um, where you know host at home, uh, like the Orange P or Raspberry P, is using uh, some micro SD card as a hard drive and only one micro SD card is pluggable in those cards and so what is done in way you know host to have uh, backups and maybe um, red or something with um, with replications yes so Basically, if I summarize the question, uh, I think you refer to the danger of using SD card because it, it can corrupt easily. So what, what about backups and stuff like this? Um, in fact, I have a few more slides. So, um, <laughs> so we are indeed working on remote backup integration. Uh, this is something uh, we are trying to get funded, and, but we will do it anyway eventually. It's just going to take more time. Uh, so basically, the idea is that you, are, you can have uh, two people, each one of them with a server, and to increase the robustness of the, ser of the backup system, instead of keeping the backup archive locally, then you can uh, upload it on, your, on some friend server. Of course, it's encrypted and, uh, and so on. So we are using Borg backup for this. Uh, we force it to, it's forcing to use Borg backup for this, and there is already some work. It's basically only integrated as an application right now, but we want to take it into the core of what you know so that it's directly available um, once you set up your instance. Uh, but basically, you would need a friend, and 
say to him, like, I, I would like to host your backup on your server, uh, and in exchange, I can host your backups, and so on. So if your server crash, uh, you are able to retrieve the backup anyway. Uh, so thanks for the project. Uh, it's very good, very great. And I'm using for ch two years or something like that. It's my uh, sister is using. And uh, just one question. Uh, I see a few days ago that uh, still the repo is based in the JCU released. And uh, I'm just surprised that it's, it's not uh, uh, stretch uh, Debian, it's not compatible, or can I upgrade my system and using still the repo for, uh, for the GC release? So, so you mean your instance is still on GC? No, it's, uh, right now it's in stretch, but the repo for Unihost is still in GC. I, maybe I, I, I'm wrong, but the stable um, released, released of Unhurst is still in Jesse, right? No, no, no. We we stopped working in Jesse uh, like six months ago. Okay. So I, I don't know. Repo exactly. uh, No, just I, th I think it's no. It should be forge.winhurst.org. Okay. If, if, <laughs> if the migration succeeded and so on. It's a wrong. Uh, it's a old uh, link. So well, well, basically, if you if you had a, an old system in Jesse and run the proper migration thing to go to Stretch, it should automatically update it. Okay, the but I didn't uh, do the things with Unhurst uh, tools. Okay, <laughs> so that's the issue. Okay, thanks. Hello, hello. Okay, uh, I have two questions, but I think they're similar. So first one, I've checked how it can be installed, and I haven't found, is it possible somehow to install an Android device? Can I install on my phone and have the same interface? So, so yeah, can you, can you repeat? Uh, is it possible to install uh, this Uno on Android device? Oh, um, no. And no plan to support? Ba basically, you need a Debian system. Okay. So. Uh, and what? Okay, and and the second the second question uh, I saw the app. So, uh, how much work I need to be able to install my uh, own application and make it a part of this Uno setup? So, what is required to make application uh, work in this setup? Yes. Um, so basically, if, if you are thinking about uh, hosting your own website, for instance, or like PHP or MySQL application, there is um, like a, an app, uh, I don't know, template. Like you can install the app and just using uh, FileZilla as an SFTP client, you can upload the files. And you, if you are thinking about a more complex application, like, I don't know, Node.js application or something very specific, uh, basically, the philosophy is that if you are able to uh, install the application by hand in the command line, then you can basically copy-paste all the command uh, you type into a script, and this is a good start for uh, what you know, application. Then you can refine it and make it, making it more generic and robust. But basically, if you are able to install it by hand, um, you are quite close to being able to create a what you know, application. There is documentation online in the Wayne well, documentation. Sorry, time's up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, my question is just. Um, the hardest part for me, uh, self-hosting with my new host, is not my new host, but it's uh, working with the limitation of the ISP. And oh, yeah. um, uh, do you have plans to try to help with that or work with ISPs? So, in fact, I was not able to to fit the Internet Cube thing in the presentation. But basically, the Internet Cube thing is trying to make and to create a plug-and-play device that you can just 
put in the end of the general public and they will plug it at home and it will be working right away. So how does it happen? Well, we use basically a VPN from the FDN Federation. So this is like uh, associative ISP in France, but it could also work with like German, IS, German uh, associative ISP, I don't know. And basically you get, well, thanks to the VPN, you actually bypass all the ISP restrictions. So for instance, like the uh, port 25 for uh, email. Thank you. Thank you.